Good evening. Hello and salam alaikum to everybody. Thank you guys for being here and thank you uh, for having me, for hosting me to uh, the Abu Dhabi Weekends, uh, Ideas Weekend Festival. It's a real honor to be here. It's an honor to be in Abu Dhabi. So I've been asked to talk to you about the power of a story, but in order to do that, I have to start by actually telling you a story. So I'm going to tell you a story. Some of you may or may not be familiar with it, but I'm going to refresh your memory. The story is about a murder that took place in 1999 in Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland has hundreds of murders every year. But this story is unusual for a number of reasons. On January 13, 1999, a young girl named Heyman Lee left her high school. She was 18 years old. People saw her drive away from the school, and she disappeared. She was supposed to pick up her cousin about half an hour later, but she never arrived. Within a couple of hours, the family knew something was really wrong. So they contacted the police, they began an investigation, but weeks went by and nobody knew what happened to Heyman Lee. Now remember, this is 1999. There's no, very few people have cell phones. Most people do not have cell phones here. The family had no idea what happened to her. About a month after she disappeared, her body was found in a local forest by a man who happened to be apparently passing through it. She had been strangled and she had been dumped there in a very unceremonious fashion. And dirt and leaves had been covered up over her body. Her car was still missing. Now, Heyman Lee, just to tell you a little bit about her, 18 years old, she was a very popular girl in her high school. She was smart, she was an academic scholar, she was on a number of athletic teams, she had a job, she was highly responsible. She was well-liked. And she was dating a guy for eight months in her senior year, or six months of her senior year, who also was very popular, smart, well-liked, athletic. They frankly made a really good-looking couple. His name was Adnan Sayed. Adnan Sayed, who by his name you might be able to guess, was not an American-American. His family came from Pakistan, and they, his parents got married in Pakistan, they moved to the United States, and they had three sons in Baltimore. Adnan was the second child. Adnan was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. And he was 17 years old at the time that Heyman Lee disappeared. They had broken up. They weren't together anymore. But he was very typical, uh, like a lot of teenagers at the time. He was very connected to his local mosque. And for Muslims who grow up in the West, a lot of us get our sense of community from the mosque. That's where we have after-school activities, you know, programming on the weekends, Sunday school. Uh, basketball games, and his family lived right down the street from the mosque. He was there every day, so were his brothers. But he also had a life outside of the mosque. He had school, he had friends in school who were not Muslim. And so he hung out with them, he partied with them, he dated. He did things that he had to hide from his parents like a lot of us did when we were teenagers. A month after Heyman Lee's body was found, Adnan was arrested for her murder. And he was about two months away from graduating from high school. When all of this happened, I was in law school. I was 25 years old, and I knew the family for many years. I knew Adnan since he was 13 years old, and he is my younger brother's best friend. And that's how I am connected to this story, because from 1999, from the moment he was arrested, he maintained his innocence, and I believed him, and his community believed him. I went through law school, um, but I wasn't able to help him as a lawyer ever. The truth is, in 1999, if you were a Muslim going to law school in America, that meant you were a failed medical student. That's what I was. I was a failed medical student. Not a lot of Muslim lawyers. Now, when Adnan had a, he had a bail hearing about a month after he was arrested, which means, you know, he's a juvenile. He should get bail. He has a no criminal record. In the hearing, what happened was this, it was remarkable, because that family was so connected to the Muslim community and so loved, hundreds of people showed up at that bail hearing, all from the Muslim community. Twelve people put up their houses. People said, put down hundreds of thousands of dollars for his bail. Businessmen, doctors, the imam, everybody was there. And the state argued, the prosecutor, ar the prosecutor argued to the judge, all of these people here, which is really remarkable, hundreds of people don't show up for a defendant. All these people here are the liability. They're the ones who are going to help him escape if you give him bail. Why? 
because he's Muslim and he's Pakistani and in their culture, it's okay to kill a woman. This was an argument made in a court in 1999 and our community was shocked. We didn't know what to do. This was before 9-11. This was before we had any idea how to organize, how to protect our civil rights. It was before we had Muslim, a lot of Muslim lawyers. We were shocked. The judge denied bail. So Adnan waited in prison for about a year. At his trial, his religion and his nationality was mentioned 300 times. Again, we didn't know what to do with this as a community. He was convicted of her murder. There's a lot of details I can't tell you right now. Why he was convicted and how he was convicted. I'll just say this. Baltimore City Police in 99 was very problematic. Raw Baltimore City Police in 2018 is very problematic. But when Adan was convicted, on the day he was convicted, I was sitting in the courtroom. The jury came in and they made their decision in two hours. The judge had dismissed us and we thought, okay, it takes weeks to get a verdict. Weeks in a murder case. And two hours we were called back and we thought, two hours, that means they know he's innocent. And they didn't. They got up and they said, they found him guilty on all counts. And after they did that, he stood up, he was very skinny, he was 18, because a year had gone by. He was handcuffed and he turned around and he said to the courtroom behind him, me, his mother, his brothers, all the community, uh, it's okay, I didn't do this. Allah knows, God knows I didn't do this. From that day, that's the year 2000, until about 2015, I did everything I could in my power to advocate for Adnan. I raised money, I helped with the appeals, we tried to find good lawyers, and we filed an appeal and lost an appeal, uh, appeal. Filed appeals, lost appeals, over and over and over. And by 2014, I was sick of it. As a lawyer, I was sick of it. I said, I give up. I have no more faith in the court system. I need to talk to somebody in the media. Because people in the media, investigative journalists, they can do things that lawyers can't do. I can't contact witnesses. I don't want to be messing up a case, right? But a journalist can. So I found somebody, I'm not going to explain how, but it was a real odd coincidence. I found somebody, uh, her name's Sarah Koenig. She was a producer for a American, popular American show called This American Life. And I explained to her, look, there's a lot of weird things in this case. You have to look at this case. Something's very wrong here. So, and she got hooked. She spent a year investigating the case. And after a year, she called me and said, Rabia, I thought she's going to do a This American Life radio show, which is a one-hour show. She said, we're going to do a 12-part series in a podcast form. And I said, what is a podcast? I had no idea what a podcast was. And she said, well, it'll be online. It'll be on the radio sometimes, but it's mostly online. I said, okay, well, whatever. You know, as long as it helps us, as long as your investigation found some new evidence, that's fine. It became an overnight sensation. And I'm not gonna talk about, like, I don't wanna explain how it happened, but for the three months that it ran, I didn't sleep for three months. It was crazy. I mean, it was the number one podcast in America, Canada, the UK, Australia. I was giving interviews to Irish radio about the case. People were hooked by the story. Not only were they hooked, people flocked to it. They said, how can we help? Investigators came forward, detectives came forward, attorneys came forward, said we wanted to help. Two of those attorneys, I realized, were really brilliant people. I said, okay, help me. Let's try to investigate this together. Now, I wanna stop and show you a video of a little bit of what happened, and then tell you the bigger story about this story. Can we play the video, please? This is a Global Cal Link prepaid call from Adnan Sayed, an inmate at a Maryland Correctional Facility. Okay, hold up. That's actually not where it all started. 18-year-old Heyman Lee disappeared on January 13th after leaving Woodlawn High School. A star student, stellar athlete, and scholastic achiever, Heyman Lee was on her way to the top. She has so much of a, uh, of a future ahead of her. There's no reason for this disappearance, and it's very troubling to the family. And we as investigators want to find her as soon as we can. Police now reveal that 18-year-old Heyman Lee died of strangulation. 
and that they discovered her 1998 Nissan Sentra a short distance from where her killer attempted to bury her body in a shallow grave in Leakin Park. Key details they had withheld as they sought out a suspect. They now have one in custody. He's identified as um, a 17-year-old Woodlawn student. His name is Adnan Musad Syed. When someone close to you dies, it hits you hard. You think, wow, that could be me someday. Friends and relatives converge on the home of 17-year-old Adnan Musad Syed. They can't believe the boy who had so much promise now faces a murder rap. He was the best person. Um, I could not imagine him doing anything like that. They just looking for somebody to blame. He cannot do it. He's such a nice, sweet child. He cannot do it. He should get what he deserves for doing this. It will be difficult, but I will go on. After more than 18 years behind bars, the men known as the West Memphis Three find that freedom has a bitter taste. I had been following the West Memphis case for many years, but the night that I watched the documentary West of Memphis, I realized something had to be done. It was time to find a reporter who would figure out exactly what happened on January 13th, 1999. From This American Life and WBEZ Chicago, it's Serial, one story told week by week. I'm Sarah Koenig. Oh, for <laughs> weeks I have felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up every time I heard that music for Serial, the greatest podcast in the history of the medium. For 12 episodes, one and a half million Americans, many of them on the cycle team, have combed <laughs> oh, yeah. through the evidence Sarah Koenig and her team lays out. Oh, in the last couple of hours, it's gone to the number one podcast in the UK. This is now the most famous, right. arguably right. wrongly convicted you know, former 17-year-old in the history of the, the judicial system. He's innocent, completely. I think he had nothing to do with it. I think he's not guilty. Shouldn't have been convicted. I am absolutely obsessed with the new Serial podcast. Yeah, man, I like it. I'm like, every time a new episode goes out, I'm just like... What are you doing? I was willing to have a conversation. <laughs> I love it so much. And I'm so honored and pleased to get to present this award to Serial and Sarah Koenig. Um, thank you, guys. Over here, I think. Uh Hi, welcome and thanks for joining us on the very first episode of the new podcast, Undisclosed. We are not journalists or podcasters. We're three lawyers who are interested in the minute details of the case of the state versus Adnan Sayed. Undisclosed, the state versus Adnan Sayed arrives today as a podcast. They said they were amateurs and it shows in this. But right now, and I'm, I'm not trying to be cruel about this, it's deadly. I could almost, I couldn't, I, I mean, I had to get through it as a critic, but it was work. The first time I realized that Susan Simpson might be the person who actually solves what happened in this case was when I read a blog she wrote about Jay's police statements. But again and again, the pattern held. Jay gets confused, pauses too long, or starts to say the wrong thing, and tap, tap, tap. And Jay knows the answer suddenly. And we have uh, proven, essentially, that the state's key witness in the case was coached by Baltimore City Police. It's absolutely inconsistent with lividity evidence and it undermines the state's entire theory of the case. Hello there. My name is Bob Ruff, and I'm the host of the Truth and Justice podcast. We had developed an army of attorneys, police officers, prosecutors, judges, people of all different walks of life and all different skill sets from around the globe have all pitched in to continue these investigations. Hello, everybody. This is Brendan Kenny, calling in from Minneapolis. I hope you enjoyed Undisclosed as much as I did. We really thought it would be maybe a one-hour radio show on NPR. We never had any idea it was going to be a podcast. We had no idea it was going to be a 12-part podcast. We had no idea how big it would get. A major ruling from American, uh, from a Maryland court, and it effectively gives Adnan Saeed, the convicted killer, a chance to call an alibi witness. That Adnan Saeed's supporters believe they have momentum after last week's ruling from the Court of Special Appeals that his appeal will be heard. The podcast has had such tremendous effect on potentially reversing a, a murder conviction. Brian, you're a big fan of that podcast. Uh, my wife and I listen to every episode. It's fascinating to see these new developments after the podcast. 
podcast concluded, it mm. may be the case that she has to start that podcast back up again. Today is day two of Adnan's post-conviction relief hearing. Hi guys, um, day four, Monday of PCR hearing. I have had no donuts today. Uh, that's probably the issue, she's had more of those. We are now happy to be part of the free Adnan team. Adnan Syed. Adnan Syed. Adnan Syed. Adnan Syed. Adnan Syed. Adnan Syed. Adnan. The free Adnan. Okay, you can clap because that always makes me happy. I want to watch this video. Now, I want to tell you the story about this story. There is a story of this case, this murder case, a wrongful conviction, one we're still fighting, by the way, in the courts. Let me tell you a little bit about what happened after this video was made. After Serial ended, it was 12 episodes. I joined up with two other lawyers. We started a podcast called Undisclosed. We did 40 episodes on Adnan's case. We went into all the evidence really, really deeply. One of the men you saw on here, Bob Ruff, Truth and Justice podcast, he started a podcast. He did 20 episodes on Adnan's case. He found evidence that one of the key witnesses who might be the suspect lied about where he was that day. We found the evidence that it got Adnan a new trial in 2016. 18 months ago, Adnan's conviction was thrown out by a judge, and he was ordered to have a new trial, but the state appealed it. So 18 months have gone by, and we're waiting for the appellate court to make a decision, and Adnan is still in prison. That's the story of the case. Here's the bigger story. When I went to Sarah Koenig in 2014, I went to her at a time, how many years after 9-11? 13 years after 9-11. I went to her at a time when anti-Muslim sentiment was at its highest in the United States. It was higher then than it was right after 9-11. I went to Sarah Koenig at a time when, as a lawyer and as a Muslim advocate, I had been working in advocacy and fighting anti-Muslim bigotry for more than a decade, and I, and I and other advocates were losing this battle, because no matter how hard we worked, it didn't matter. People didn't like us. Conservatives didn't like us for one reason, and liberals didn't like us for another reason. We polled at the bottom of every ethnic religious group possible, even in the non-religious. We poll lower than atheists and maybe even Satanists in America, okay? I went to her at a time when majority of Republicans who were polled in the United States said Muslims shouldn't be able to run for office. Some of them said Muslims shouldn't be able to vote. So when I went to Sarah Koenig, I went to her scared because I said, in this climate, who is going to care about this man? He doesn't look like this anymore. He looks like that man you saw at the end. He looks like somebody, if he walked down the street, people might say that he looks like the Taliban, he looks scary. I said, who's gonna care? Look at me, I'm his advocate. His mother looks like me, she covers too. Nobody's gonna care. And I couldn't believe that nobody cared that he was a Muslim. Everybody cared about the story. And what I realized at that point, because what happened was we raised half a million dollars through donations for Adnan. Tens of thousands of letters were written to him in that prison after Serial. This book, I wrote this book with Adnan after Serial happened. Every single chapter in this book starts with Quran or Hadith. Okay? For those of you who are not familiar, Quran is a Muslim scripture. Hadith are the traditions of the Prophet. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to share the Muslim worldview with people who read the book so they understand how we think about things. This book became a New York Times bestseller, and I am guessing it might be the only New York Times bestseller ever where every chapter starts with Quran or Hadith. Okay. This happened because, not because we were great advocates, but because somebody was able to tell a great story. And that wasn't me, that was Sarah Koenig and Serial. But she taught me a lesson that I realized none of us knew. There are hundreds of American Muslim advocates who for years have been saying the same thing since 9-11. Islam is a religion of peace. Islam is a religion of peace. Islam. Nobody's buying it. The thing we never did was tell our stories. The thing we never did was humanize our experience. And one thing I realized is we also don't do that inside our communities. We don't tell stories about one another. We're very uncomfortable with that. We don't want to talk about the bad stuff. When this all went public, so many people in the Muslim community said, don't talk about who he was dating. Don't tell people that. I was like, your kids are probably dating too. Get over it. Um, 
So the power of storytelling to me has become, I, what I realize is this, I don't care if you're in government, I don't care if you're a, a public advocate, I don't care if you're talking about social justice, I don't care if you're in business, I don't care if you're in a courtroom, the person who tells the best story wins. And I'll end there. Thank you.